Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming to the center's online speaker series. Um, Indigenous Americans, we're still here. Tonight's talk, Mapping Erasure, Acknowledging the Siouan Indians of the Piedmont with Lucy Wall Stelianopoulos. I'm Carolyn Merrick, I'll be your Zoom host this evening. So I have some housekeeping to do and then I will turn it over to um, Melanie Benjamin, our philanthropy director who will say a few words about the center before we begin the program. Everybody is muted and you will be muted throughout the presentation. If at any time you have a question, please put it in the chat. And at the end of Lucy's presentation, I will then field as many of those questions to Lucy or comments. Uh, questions or comments are welcome um, as we can do in the time we have. Uh, let's see. Dum, dum, dum. Yes, and if you would please be so kind as to stay until the end of the presentation, we have a short uh, five question survey and your feedback is really important to us. It helps us shape and grow our programming. Okay, uh, let's see, I think I've covered everything I need to cover. So I'm gonna turn it over to our um, philanthropy director, Melanie Benjamin. Hi, thanks a lot, Carolyn. Um, my name is Melanie Benjamin. I'm the philanthropy director here at the center. The center's mission is to provide what research indicates are the keys to healthy aging physical, intellectual, and social wellness programs. Lifelong learning is a big part of this, both learning for the sake of learning and also how to navigate a complex and ever-changing world. The center is pleased to provide the second installment of our Building a More Inclusive Community Speaker Series. This current series, as well as this past four speaker series, have been made possible through the generosity of our speakers and the hard work of a dedicated group of center volunteers and staff. These speaker series are provided for free and are open to all, but as you might imagine, they're not free to produce. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say, if you value this type of programming or other aspects of the center's healthy aging mission, please consider making a donation to support our work. As a nonprofit, 60% of our budget comes from friends like you. A web link is available in the Zoom chat should you wish to make a gift tonight. It is my great pleasure now to introduce Mike Wilson, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you so much and take it away, Mike. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mike Wilson and I'm part of the, sub, the uh, DEI subcommittee who uh, worked on putting together uh, the speaker series. Um, just a quick a little aside before I introduce Go into the introduction. Uh, in 1990, George W. Bush, our former president, designated November as a month to recognize the sacrifice, contributions, and ongoing achievements of Native American people. Uh, this is the month that we're we're holding this series in, and uh, it's it's really significant. Uh, here's a land acknowledgement. I am present just outside of the city of Charlottesville on land that was traditionally that of the Monacan Nation. They cared for their land as the land cared for them. They were forced from that land. However, the bones of their ancestors continue to be buried here in these lands. And I ask you to take a moment to consider this. Thank you. Tonight's speaker is Lucy, uh, who is of uh, North, North Carolina Saponi heritage. She is a research librarian for art, archeology, span classics, and indi indigenous studies at University of Virginia. Her presentation will focus on the Catawba deerskin map and colonial settler maps of Piedmont, North Carolina and Virginia. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Lucy. Take it away, Lucy. Thank you, Mike. It'll take me just a moment to get my screen going here. Um, well, there it is, sorry. <laughs> And in the meantime, I want to thank all of you for inviting me to be here with you. 
and uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, this project, which is an ongoing project of four to five years um, of looking for people and trying to erase erasure, if, as you might say, um, and finding the people that I know were there in four different centuries. So I'm uh, letting you know that you actually are the test people for this uh, talk. Originally, it was uh, planned for two different versions of a um, MESDA symposium, which is the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and they have been postponed. So you get the first version. So you're, you're looking at mapping erasure one. So I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you also know it's a work in progress, definitely. Um, I would, as I said, like to thank um, Caroline and Melanie, certainly Mike and Mary, my, my good friends for the invitation and the center. I would also like to thank the people where we are and the importance of these people will be, um, will be part of this talk. Charlottesville and the surrounding area sit on the unceded homelands of the Monacan people who remain the stewards of the land. We acknowledge their elders and their people, both past and present. This is the beginning of my attempt to find and acknowledge the Sioux and Indians of the Piedmont. And I think we take a moment to understand what we mean by Piedmont. Um, obviously it's a colonizer term and it means foot of the mountains or the foothills as I grew up knowing it. It's not the high mountains, but the um, area just beneath as the mountains begin to rise. I am going to be talking to you about a people who see their first, um, the the first example of them are noted in John Smith's map of Virginia from 1612. And I'll try to use my cursor to help with this. They are located up here and that would be the Monacan people, the people we just, we just spoke about. And they are on the map from the beginning um, in 1612. So we, we know who we're talking about. Um, the other unusual thing that I'm going to do is rather than take you a timeline from 1612 to um, the 20th century, I'm going to take you backwards. I feel like this is, has been a time tunnel voyage for me, and I feel like it, it's best seen as a time tunnel voyage for you. It will be less, uh, less change in your historical narrative if we walk together back through the tunnel. So I'll come and go between reading and talking to you about this. Uh, the John Smith map of 1612 is the starting point for the accepted historical narrative of the American Indians of Virginia and North Carolina. It also included one of the first references to the Sioux speakers of the Piedmont, that would be the Monacans. Early maps of the region called Virginia were meant to be seen and read from east to west. And I think this is always a little bit troubling to, uh, to folks when they first encounter this. But this, of course, is the eastern shore. And you're reading from the English perspective back to the west up here. So you're, um, most of the time, we tend to think maps read north to south. Um, and that's simply not going to be the case for these very early ones. This approach shed the best light possible on the populated areas of the colony, which at this time included mostly Indian towns. And there are very, very few population centers that are colonizer centers in 1612, as you can well imagine. As uh, Mike said, I teach um, research methods and I teach all the new graduate students in the art department and in the indigenous studies um, fellowship. And I teach them how to, how to put together research and how to learn to research with respect. What I also teach them currently, and I ask you to keep in mind as we go through this uh, talk, is that story, storytelling 
is an aspect of indigenous research. Recently, more and more books have come out uh, making this a fact and encouraging um, colonizing colonizer uh, scholars to include storytelling in their own research. I also would like you to note uh, some, of the, some of the tenets of um, indigenous research, that being one of the most important ones, reciprocity and respect in doing research. There is no doing research on people. You do research with people. It is important to recover marginalized voices. A lot of these voices were not only margin marginalized, but completely shut down in earlier centuries. So you're trying to recover all the voices. That leads you to the difference between, as I teach my students, the lack of difference between historiography and genealogy. Um, at least in an academic setting, there's, always, there's often a disparaging word about genealogy. Um, among uh, academic librarians. Genealogy is the same as historiography. Historiography is about famous wealthy people who make a name and then their family is history. Genealogy is about you and me working people who work and live in any century. Their history is genealogy. So I, I make no difference in those two things and I think it's rather silly too. And lastly, I want you to note um, that I am talking about rewriting history, R-I-G-H-T, not rewriting history, W-R-I-T-E. And I make that difference because the whole purpose of this exercise and this research is to include all the right parts of this historical narrative and to pull them together and talk about them. I myself descend from both sides of the historical narrative as many people do. I'm both uh, on the colon colonizer side and on the indigenous side. So I think that telling this story in the right way is, is the rewriting of history. And I'm very much in favor of that. And for me, this is also very much a family affair. Um, I'm sharing with you the photograph of my grandmother. Um, you can see up there, it's from 1916 when she was 12 years old and she's uh, pictured with her aunt. Many traveling itinerant photographers seem to have come through rural areas in North Carolina and photographed people in front of their homes. You notice uh, this is a um, log house behind her. Um, storytelling and stories about indigenous people are often concerned with grandmothers and grandfathers. They're important figures in the life of children and the association and relationship between children and their own past has been very important for me and has been, is very important in indigenous research as well. I'm going to tell you about a number, a few grandmothers and grandfathers, and I won't give you all those lists of greats and greats and greats because that just um, makes your mind, it makes your head hurt. So I will just call them grandmothers and grandfathers. That's my, my, one, uh, my one thing I'd like to do. I'm also going to tell you a couple of things about my own family story and my own family's patterns. And patterns are what I research and what I look for in doing in trying to research people who have had most of their history erased. There, there are patterns in my own family stories. There are snippets of stories that have to be linked together in some way. And I've tried to link them together with the documents in this talk. Um, there are physical uh, family patterns where they live and where, where they exist and the land they refer back to. There are also tangible tactile family patterns. And I'm going to tell you a story about one of my grandmother's quilts. I spent uh, my summers with my grandmother, um, Granny Nanny, as we called her. That was her name, Nanny. And her name was Nanny Mae Shaver. And she, um, she had my brother and I with her in the summers, and we would do all kinds of things with her. She lived on a farm that had all sorts of fruit trees. And 
it's where I first learned uh, that I could go. I had to go look for chinky pins every year to make sure we got them when they opened up or we learned about plums and pears and all kinds of uh, different different things that she grew or she picked. We also went barefoot most of the summer because she went barefoot in her 60s and she was still going barefoot in her 80s. So uh, we spent a lot of, lot of time with her. One thing we did was we cleaned the cemetery because the cemetery, if you ever think about it, the cemetery has to be cleaned or it'll be a mess. And it used to be that all those ribbons um, on, to, on, on wreaths were uh, made of cloth. I don't, I'm not really sure what they're made of now, and I'm not even sure they use them anymore. But we collected cemetery ribbons from the trash, <laughs> from, the, from the areas that where they'd been blown away. And uh, my grandmother took those cemetery ribbons and she washed them, cleaned them up, and she made a quilt for me and a quilt for my brother. My brother's quilt was red and the backing was from flower sacks because my grandfather ran a store. So he had flower bags that they sold and she made us all kinds of things from the flower, material, flower sack material. And so his was bright, shiny red because all those ribbons are ribbons after all, they're shiny. And mine was chartreuse because there were a lot of green ribbons that faded and had a pink rim around it. So there were a lot of red ribbons that faded too. So what I remember is how much when I first saw a ribbon dress, when uh, my friend here who was chopped off first was showing and talking about ribbon dresses, how much my quilt, how much the ribbon dresses reminded me of my grandmother's quilts. So that's a family pattern for me, that and the uh, river along which they, they resided. A second thing that is a family pattern for me is what I call the bean year. All of our calendar, as we knew it, rested around the planting and harvesting of beans. They were terribly important. And some of you will probably recognize these, especially if you're from North Carolina, you may recognize the terms I use for them. Um, we had, we planted Aunt May's little beans in the spring, and those are those basic half runner beans you're used to. And we hilled them in the summer, the most awful job I ever had in my life, hilling those beans and um, terrible thing for a uh, 10 year old to do. We also then planted in the summer, what we called October beans that were harvested in the fall gray beans that are really delicious. And I learned as an adult that they are cranberry beans. And then we also harvested what were called roasting ear beans. And I'm saying that nicely. We actually called them roasting ear beans. And those were beans that were, they were peas um, that were grown with the um, corn stalks. So they grew up the stalk in the native manner and were planted to grow that way. So we harvest them when the corn was um, at roasting ear stage, which is the ear that you give to animals. And then finally, we took some of those beans, all those beans, and we strung them up on a string and dried them in the attic and um, had them ready to eat what we call leather britches in December. So I grew up with this, not knowing where this came from, not understanding it. But my research, I think, has brought me to understand my grandmother much better and who she was and uh, what she learned, because she was a marvelous healer as well. So in my effort to take you backwards, I'm going to begin, as I did, with the early 20th century my grandmother in 1916. And now I'm going to walk you back into the 19th century, which is argu arguably for me, the century of the great removals. It's also the century of race as a institutionalized practice. It's also the century where my great grandfather made choices, where my, where his fathers made choices. And I think some of those choices are reflected here. Um, I go immediately to the 1830s because I'm from the Southeast United States. And I will say removals and racial laws were anything but new 
to the territories that we call the United States. But they saw a real zenith in the 19th century. Racial laws became codified and very precise and very well applied in the Southern regions, after, particularly after the American Revolution. Racial laws had regulated family life in the Virginia colony and the Carolinas after the, um, as early as after the Powhatan Wars. So this is something that we knew about and we functioned with them. In order to understand the impact that erasure had on the Southeast tribes, we really look to the great removals of the 19th century, including the Cherokee removal of the 1830s that particularly affected the balance of Indian life in the Carolinas. Um, the Cherokee are one of the great tribes of North Carolina, of what is currently North Carolina. The removals, as I found, scooped up any Indian available. And there were many in North Carolina. <laughs> Others joined, other Indians in North Carolina joined stronger tribes like the Catawbas who retained a protected status in South Carolina. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that, but there was a pretty common um, move in with each other attitude in the, in the Southeast. The choice for Indians during the removal period was to remove to Indian territory across the Mississippi or stay and become homeless. And there are all kinds of accounts in the uh, Catawba documents of homeless Indians wandering um, up and down these paths and roads in the 19th century. The resulting laws of 1838 in North Carolina enforced divorce to interracial couples and the loss of title land by the 1840 census. So um, in, my, in the case of my family, land was owned and land was not owned between 1830 and 1840. The stories, of my grand, the stories of my grandmother told of the success of both of these erasure efforts, all these erasure efforts. The racial laws of the post removal era in the 1830s also created new classifications for people of color. Free people of color, including American Indians, lived together with neighbors and owned land in the colonial South in the early US Republic. Many American Indians fought in the, Re in the American Revolution on both sides. And many also fought in what uh, has been termed the uh, American Civil War of 1812 um, on both sides, again. Um, now, I didn't invent that term, American Civil War of 1812. That was uh, something suggested by Professor Alan Taylor here at UVA, who has written on the importance of the War of 1812. I had a lot of um, ancestors who fought in the War of 1812, and I never could figure out why. I mean, what were they doing down there? Because I thought it was just about New Orleans. Well, now I know much more about that, and it's, it would be interesting if anyone wants to talk about it. My grandfather, William Barber, was born in Dinwiddie County, Virginia, 1745, when the Saponi Indians, of which he uh, it appears on one of their roles in 1830, moved to Virginia, and he lived his life as both a free person of color and an Indian non-taxable, which he was recorded as in 1820. In 1820, he was living in Surrey County, North Carolina, that I'll be telling you about soon. He fought, it, um, he fought in the Virginia line during the revolution and received a land grant for his efforts. However, in the 1830 census, he became a mulatto, as did his daughter, my grandmother, Betsy Shaver. And so we come full circle. We've erased these people's people as Indians by 1830, and we now have a, de a new designation for them. So when you come uh, in contact with that term mulatto in North Carolina records, it often does mean an Indian. So where do we sit? We've gone through the removals. We've worked our way back to the War of 1812. We could also talk about Washington and Jefferson and their um, plans for the, in, the American Indian population east of the Mississippi, which included removing them west of the Mississippi, and thus we have the Louisiana Purchase. Um, we could discuss many of those uh, events that took place after the American Revolution, but um, I'm taking you to what is called the Colet map, 
1770. And this therefore is the colony of North Carolina. So at this point, I'm gonna be talking to you about colonial maps and how indigenous map making differs from colonizer map making. So the, the Cole map of 1770 was on the eve of the American Revolution. It had, um, I'm sorry, I have to apologize to you for my eyesight. I have macular degeneration early onset and sometimes I kind of lose the line if you know what I mean. So let me look at that. Ah, and North Carolina had become one of the original 13 colonies. It mustered soldiers for both the continental line and the militia, as well as maintaining a healthy loyalist cause. So you have to understand that this is a rather turbulent place in the 1770s. There are all kinds of um, battles that take place before Lexington and Concord. So um, Cole is showing you what it looked like right before all these battles uh, began to take place. You'll notice the back country has moved uh, westward to the Appalachian Mountains rather than in John Smith's map of a previous century that now the Piedmont appears to be a, um, a settled part of, um, of North Carolina. And I'm gonna use, I hope you can see my cursor because I'm gonna use it here to show you what Piedmont is, it stretches up into Virginia and it stretches down into South Carolina. So it is the foothills of the, these very tall Appalachian mountains over here and the Blue Ridge. The Blue Ridge sort of extends with a little hook out this way. So understanding that you have here a whole area that is filled with Indian people in 1770 and before, and then you have a great river, a great river that runs, you can see it on this map, straight up here. And they don't quite, the colonizer map maker doesn't quite understand. He hasn't seen all of this river. This river is currently called, and on this map is called the Yadkin River. So keep that river in mind because we're gonna talk about that river a lot. That's my home river there. So um, on a more detailed scale, he does have show the Yadkin River here as it makes a great turn that's called the uh, East Bend. You're looking at the Yadkin River. If you look right down here, you can see the beginnings of Winston-Salem. And if you're over here, you would see the beginnings of Wilkesboro, North Carolina. So you can kind of orient yourself. If you've gone down Highway 77 in your lifetime, it goes right, um, let me think. I think it, go, it splits the Fisher and the Mitchell. So it comes right down here. So Highway 77 runs um, pretty close to the Great Warrior Path and the Great uh, Wagon Road. So, but um, it takes, you know, it takes the easy path. So it doesn't go through all the little fording places of rivers. Right down here was a very important spot as well called the Shallow Ford. It, um, the Yakim River in this area has great shoals and those shoals allow for uh, fording the river. There's one here at Rockford. The river runs quite, actually the river runs its regular path and the um, land mass is raised. So at times you could actually drive your wagon or even walk, certainly ride your horse across the Shallow Ford. So that gives you a sense that this was an area people could move around in very well. Even though it looks mountainous, there, there were all kinds of paths that went through here. So Colonial Surrey County, North Carolina comprised six modern counties, Surrey, Yadkin, Wilkes, Allegheny, Stokes, and Forsyth. Backcountry troops for both the battles of Kings Mountain and the Battle of Guilford Courthouse amassed in Surrey County. Surrey County was also the home to many pacifist religious sects, including Quakers and Baptists, with settlements along the, along the creeks feeding the Yadkin River, and, a Morav and Moravians in Salem at the Wachovia Track, and we'll look at that in a few minutes. To settler map makers, this was a land of opportunity in 1770, and that's why this, these maps are created, to bring people in, to have more settlers in North Carolina in 1770. 
To the Siouan people of the Piedmont, this was a disaster. And it, it, you can tell it on the ground as we do more archeological work. As traders and messengers, Siouan tribes like the Saponi and the Catawba occupied the vast well-watered lands where the great trading path, the warrior path, and the settler wagon road led by 1750. So by 1750, all those paths were coming together right through Salem, right through Winston-Salem down here, because they were using the shallow ford. Oops, I'm sorry. I think I turned, hit the wrong cursor there. There we go. Okay, in our effort to walk backwards, we're going back to 1753, which is the settlement of the Moravians in the um, historic site you may know as Old Salem in North Carolina. It's a lovely place to visit. I grew up within it and connected to it and part of it. And I love to go back there every year at Christmas for the candle tea. So go enjoy that if you want to. But now you can go down 77 and get there or 40. So the Wachovia Track. In 1752, the Moravians surveyed the Wachovia tra Track and founded their first settlement of the Fabra. In, in 1753, Salem, the modern Winston-Salem, came later in 1766. And royal governors make a lot of mention of bringing in the uh, Moravians and settlers like the Moravians or uh, the Scots-Irish are also referred to that way um, because they're hardworking and they transform the land and they do, um, they put a great, to energy into the land and make it better than it was. Now, better than it was means better, better than the land as it had been stewarded by the American Indian um, people who owned it. So, um, nevertheless, these people were religious dissenters. So, this is in the peer in the colonial period. So, nothing is legal except. Um, the Anglican Church. So what you have here is a combination. You have these people, the Moravians, who want to come here and settle and practice their, um, their religion, which is communal. And you also have a document here that shows you property value. And I know this is very hard to see. This, um, this is called the Hoger map, and it was just discovered a few years ago, actually. Um, hanging on a wall in the single brother's house at Old Salem. And if you are able to, I did see this up close, um, what, that, what they have created here is a map of where to build. There are some areas here. This is, this is the upper area that comes close to the Yakin. This is one of the um, tributaries of the Yakin up here. And there are areas that say this would be a good place for a town. There are areas that say already, this is Mr. Froelich's um, mill. So he's already there. There are already settlers in there and it designates property owners. Now that's not uncommon. That's what you see in uh, 17th century Virginia that the maps, uh, the settler maps are designated by the property owners as you go along any road that's created. So um, makes it very easy if you're property owner to find where you were and establish your um, Patton. So um, these these same Moravian um, these same Moravian farmers and artisans and uh, cabinet makers and mill owners, particularly, are depicted on Collet's map in 1770. You see very prominently Frohick's mill down in an area of Iredale County, where there also we see in um, the list of uh, on the Dawes list that where um, Indian uh, people were picked up by the army and sent to Oklahoma. So you right, right there at the mill. So you, you know what, what's happening there. None of these churches were legal until after the, the American Revolution. Since the colonial governments were based on Angl the Anglican parish system, the Moravians had to request a special um, parish be created for their Wachovia track. And it was known as Dobbs Parish. It was created by uh, the Royal Governor Dobbs. I think it's interesting to look at this, um, the, uh, the insignia here. 
it's a deer that's been shot and this helps us date the map and know it's the Hoger map because there was a great deer hunt among the, these, uh, there weren't that many people, about 15 young men who settled the Thabra and created the settlement and the palisade of the fort at, when they first got there. And they went on a big deer hunt. So both the map and the insignia are commemorating their prowess and how they're transforming the land. Now, how did we get there? How did we get to the fact that the Moravians um, see this land as open territory? Because throughout there, and they keep copious diaries, very interesting reading. The Mora Moravian archives in um, Winston-Salem keep the records of the Southern um, Moravian um, archives. And so that means they keep all the records of the Moravians and the Cherokee Indians. And that those are copious records and they've been published. We have them um, here at UVA and when there are some new volumes. They're a really interesting read as you see how the Moravians understood that they were coming into this land where they created the Thabra and that there, there was no one there. And then, oh, all of a sudden we have some trade going on and Indians appear whom they refer to as, all of them as, as Cherokee Indians. So this is to reinforce the fact that hunting grounds extended beyond um, homelands. So it's an idea that you must keep in mind for this whole area because the, there are um, hunting paths and warrior paths that come all the way down from the Iroquois nations in New York. So it's a very well-traveled land. It has many roads that people are crossing all the time and they cross right across North Carolina. So um, everybody runs into each other. This is a picture I took of Fort Dobbs um, about a month ago, absolutely beautiful day. And um, Fort Dobbs is pretty typical of the forts created in, um, along the British system in the 18th century at least. Um, it was a fort built in the 1750s at the time of the Cherokee Wars. The Cherokee had had enough and they crossed the mountains for hunting and they then declared war on the increasingly intense settlement of this area of the Piedmont that you've seen in the maps. So uh, 1754 is a real um, important date to remember for that um, particularly. So Fort Dobbs, um, Fort Dobbs sits, if you are again on Highway 77, Fort Dobbs sits right at Statesville, North Carolina. And um, it protects the, the fledgling settlements of uh, Salisbury, which is one of the earliest backcountry settlements. And um, I think it's Fourth Creek Meeting House, which was the first name of Statesville. So that, that's all right together. And those were very important. Um, very important early settlements. And there were a number of uh, settlers already in the region, enough to fill this fort in 1754, so when the Cherokees attacked. Forts were built by colonial gover governors throughout the 18th century and with many different objectives. We know that in the mid 18th century, the British colonial government fought wars with several American Indian nations and with France, pr primarily for control of the land west of the Appalachian Mountains. So the intention is to go west, is to go beyond what is known as the proclam proclamation line of 1763. The result of the war with France and her native allies was the Treaty of Paris in six 1763 and the British self-styled proclamation line of 1763. For native peoples in this region, the line was of no consequence given the reality that already existed in the Piedmont. So the proclamation line was for settlers, by settlers, well, by their king who said, don't go any further. He said, this is it, Fort Dobbs, Statesville sits right on the edge of the proclamation line. And these kind of forts actually I learned at Fort Dobbs are a product of the battles and the wars with the Scots 
in uh, which culminated in uh, the battle in 1745. So these are these are strong forts. I mean, this is this is not an original. The um, the terrain is original. The well inside the fort is original. So you can see how people actually managed to survive uh, attacks both ways. And um, this, th the British built on what they learned about fighting the Highland Scots when they built these forts. And there, you can put a lot of people in this fort, most definitely, not happily, but you can. Um, fort Dobbs was one of the last colonial forts at, built near the Park Proclamation Line, that's hard for me, during the Cherokee period. The Cherokee Wars in 1754 and, and later affected the settlers of both Bethabara and Fort Dobbs. Now, the, obviously, the Cherokees attacked Fort Dobbs, and there was a very, um, pretty much an even draw battle that took place there. They also came to the Palisade of Bethabara, and um, many of the settlers who were in the back country took refuge, refuge there. Uh, let's see. The other thing that is, is quite interesting uh, is the series of what some people refer to as Indian summits. They are actually, they are both summits and they're treaty negotiations. Um, and they take place throughout the, the 17th century in Virginia and throughout the 18th century um, in the Southeast. The interesting thing about them, they are usually instigated by Virginia because Virginia has a, has a claim that it has to go all the way to the Mississippi River that it really attempts to enforce. And um, so they're often about land aggrandizement um, of Kentucky and of Ohio. And so you just have treaty after treaty. Um, Virginia is also interested in keeping the Iroquois on the side of, on the British side. So in the mid century, um, after the Cherokee Wars, they began to invite the Iroquois to the table. So a lot of, some of these um, summits are held, uh, one important one is held in Albany which produces the Treaty of Albany. And then you just have them, I could give you year after year here, um, starting from 1722, where you just have one summit after the other. And you'll hear about the Treaty of, of Logstown. That was one that helped uh, give Virginia, Kentucky. The Treaty, uh, the Lancaster Treaty, the Treaty of Pine Hill that uh, sent the Catawba on the, one of the earliest removals of uh, tribes from North Carolina. The Catawba had to leave their original uh, homelands and move into South Carolina where they could be protected. And, you know, just one after the other. So the, um, the Treaty of Paris in 1763 is to the indigenous populations, just one more loss and one more, and each time the loss is, is land. Um, most of the time they were instigated by the royal governors of Virginia and, and dominated increasingly by the Northern tribes. The common result was the loss of native homelands. Warfare was a common place for settlers in the North Carolina and Virginia Piedmont because they attempted to appropriate native land for their own agricultural use. So then you have a series of, um, you have a series of wars that go on in North Carolina. The, uh, one of the most famous is the Tuscarora War of, 17, um, of 1711 and the Yamasee Wars of 1715. And these are on the eastern part of the, in the eastern part of the state as North Carolina begins to be settled. East, remember, east to west, the way the maps run, east to west. Um, but later, um, you have also the situation where the Catawba, enter the scene and they are earlier, you have it. They sit in the middle and they govern the trade routes and they are fierce fighters and also have a strong reputation. So you see in these early documents, reference, references to the Catawba and the Saponi who are, their, um, who are their allies in keeping the trading path and the Piedmont open and um, less hazardous for uh, native peoples as well as others. Um, 
let's see. The Catawba kept peace in the Sioux and Piedmont primarily due to the strength and num their strength in numbers and their fierce reputation. What is not talked about is the fact that the, the royal governors also built forts to protect the Indians. So forts weren't just to protect settlers, they were to keep Indians away from the settlers, um, to keep settlers away from the Indians um, when the treaties designated Indian land, and that Indian land, do keep uh, in mind, was circumscribed. One of the most famous was Fort Christiana in 1717, uh, built by Governor Spotswood, and uh, what makes it famous for many reasons is the fact that Spotswood wanted to contain particularly the Saponis because they had gotten a pretty strong reputation um, for moving around. They did that, they moved from North Carolina to Virginia, from Virginia back to North Carolina, they, they moved wherever they wanted to and he wanted to contain them. But he also created one of the earliest, not the earliest, but one of the early boarding schools at Fort Christiana. And uh, that boarding school was created to house hostage children who were brought in uh, by the Saponi and the Catawba and um, also the Meharan and the Nottaway as well, probably the Monacans, but I don't have a direct reference to that one. The fort failed and was closed in 1718, but many of the Saponi continued to live near Fort Christiana. All right, so now we've, we've sort of set up the settler state here. We, we know where we are. So in the 18th century, North Carolina was very much Indian country. That's the first sort of the first place you can say, hey, you know, this was the, the furthest east, I might say. Um, it's where everyone fled to, and it's where the Catawba kept as much peace as they could. Um, and the towns of the Siouan tribes that made up this population were all along the rivers beneath the lower mountains, not the high mountains, but the lower mountains. The Siouan tribes of the greater Piedmont. Now, one thing I wanted to mention here is we're very well acquainted, I think, with the Powhatan Confederacy, which is the confederacy um, of the Tidewater region in general. Smaller tribes um, coalesced in the 17th century. But there's also the Monacan Confederacy and perhaps more, perhaps even the Catawba Confederacy. So keep in mind as we move through this, um, Jeff Hampman has done a, a great job of talking about the Mon Monacan Confederacy, as I'll tell you in just a moment. Um, the Siouan tribes of the greater Piedmont of Virginia and later Carolina, which was the original name of both Carolinas, C-A-R-O-L-A-N-A, -A, Carolina, um, included the Monacans, the Saponi, the Soras, the Lumbee, Okanichi, Eno, Catawba, Totoro, and many more. There were smaller ones also that I haven't mentioned. Um, there was also the Kiowa, which is an older, older name for, um, quite possibly an older name for the, either the Sora or the Catawba. Um, so the, histor the colonial historical, historical narrative was written by Virginia, colonizers and tended to stress the accomplishments of the Powhatan Confederacy because they were allies at the time of um, the Virginia Company and because this was the beginning of where settler history started. Nevertheless, UVA archeologist um, Jeffrey Hampman in his meticulously researched monograph, Monica Millennium, rewrites that historical narrative to include the Monacan Confederacy. He ties the Saponi who traveled fluidly between the colonial boundaries of Virginia and North Carolina to the Monacans and adds another piece to the puzzle that unifies the Siouan tribes. I mean, a lot of Jeff's work really gives us a way to understand those Siouan tribes. Hampman notice, uh, notes that the five major Monacan towns were mentioned as early as the Smith map of 1612, previously shown, including Rasowick, the Monacan chief's, um, Monacan chief's seat on the Point of Rock at the confluence of the James and Rivanna Rivers in Virginia. 
I've been to that site and it is a quite an amazing site. And Rasawick also was noted in, in, the, in the Catawba records regarding the Saponi. So the Saponi are also involved with Rasawick. So you have those two groups coming together with uh, Jeff's very um, brilliant idea about the, Confeder the Monacan Confederacy and how it functions. Both the Monacans and the Saponi were at Rasawick in the 18th century and both spoke a form of Tutelo along with their neighbors in the south and north of the Piedmont. Um, I noted here Suan milestones because Suan milestones aren't necessarily the same as Powhatan mines, milestones. So we began to see a lot more um, reference to historical narrative when we include the Catawba records. They're, they are, have a number of records in their archives and a number, they are mentioned in the Catawba and the Saponi are mentioned in a number of 18th century documents. So you can begin to see their movement. And the paths, of course, that we've talked about are important there. So this is Indian country in 1747. And it's also a settler map, but this is uh, done by Emmanuel Bowen in 1747. And I hope you can see, because I can just barely see <laughs> here, that here is the region that we were looking at as the um, Yadkin River region where we were seeing Mr. Frohoek's mill and we were on the Cole map of 1770. And here we're seeing nothing but Indian towns. Uh, the Kiowa Old Town, that's the Sora site, Sora Town, um, that's referred to many times and you can still see near Pilot Mountain, North Carolina, the Totiro. And you also see that the river that we have called the uh, Yadkin River is the Sapona River. So in 25 years, all these people have left? I don't think so. So we have, I think, established with these maps our sort of backward walk into the Indian presence that was erased when the settlers began to inhabit more of western, northwestern North Carolina. You see the Catawba over here in this region, and they sort of get a little confused with the, the rivers. Um, if you are interested in knowing when the Spanish came in, uh, there's also a reference here to the group, the, the Johara site, uh, which is near Hickory. So Indian country in 1747, the Monacans, the Saponi and the Catawbas all populated towns along major river systems. Those towns are carefully noted in Bowen's map of North Carolina in 1747, which is only a few years after my Saponi grandfather was born while the tribe was in Virginia again. Bowen captures some of this in Endear, enduring lively native experience on his map and mirrors the documents of Catawba history that record a thriving presence for North Carolina Indian country in the 18th century, 25 years before everyone else comes. Um, these native towns are oddly enough missing on a map that I don't think I have for you. I don't think I included that. A map from 18, around 1840, there are, oddly enough, all these towns are missing on um, the map done by the Surveyor General of uh, North Carolina with an effort, in an effort to bring in more settlers. So um, it's, we're beginning erasure right here in 1747. The, Cat the Catawba, however, could not be easily erased. They were major players in all the Indian summits of the 18th century and negotiated for their smaller neighbors, many of whom joined them for protection in the post-revolutionary war period. So back here we are with the upper Yadkin and I'm doing this for a personal reason because my family is here on the Elkin River here and archeological evidence, uh, Wake Forest University dug a lot of um, archeological sites along the Yadkin and it just fills, it just dots the whole Yadkin River. Um, I have a map between the Fisher River and where the Great Bend is here. And there are more than 60 sites just on that corner. Towns, small towns, probably family groups. They are uh, found, uh, they proliferate in the woodland period before contact and they continue on into the post-contact period. 
And I have to thank my um, my archaeologist on the site, Hal Transu, for his acumen in determining uh, the value of artifacts that were part of the family. And uh, it includes many things. And he's been able to um, match those with some of the pottery that's been collected, known as the Dan River style pottery. Um, my grandmothers and grandfathers settled along these rivers and creeks in their towns. And we can find the remains of their towns in the form of artifacts such as potsherds, pipe stems, and arrow points that remain in my possession, but also are being dug up every day. There's a, an excavation going on right here where the Elkin River enters the Yadkin. Um, they also, uh, the potsherds are interesting because they're decorated by impressing nets into the wet clay. And they seem to be, that seems to be pretty common among um, the American Indian populations along the Dan River Basin, which is actually, was originally called the Roanoke River. It's just the extent of the Roanoke River. And the Roanoke River is just above here. So the Roanoke River almost touches the Ararat River. And you can see how these Sioux and tribes could move between the Monacan uh, lands into the Roanoke River Basin and then into the Yadkin River Basin. Um, they're interesting because these, um, you can still see the remains of fishing weirs in the shoals here. There are a lot of shoals right here where the river turns and it becomes much faster down here. Um, so they were very fond of fishing and seining. I don't know if you know what seining is. Um, I had a, a great uncle who died from seining in the river. It's casting nets in the river. It's a very, um, important form of fishing for um, indigenous peoples. And here we are, the Catawba map for Governor Nicholson in 1721. Um, I hope you can see this. I, I know it's, it's not, you can't read everything carefully there. So I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, so what did the native people's experience? How did they record it? What did they think about it? Here's how they recorded it. This is one, a deerskin map. It is actually a, a paper copy. There are two copies of this map and it replicates a map that was originally um, done on a uh, deerskin. And you can see, as you look here, that the shape of the deer is retained, okay? So just to give you an idea, all right? Luckily, we don't have to guess. The, about the experience of the 18th century Sioux and tribes. Since the Catawbas were such good record keepers, the Catawbas enjoyed a steady relationship with the Royal Governor of South Carolina, and that would be Francis Nicholson that we we're talking about there the early, in the early 18th century. According to the work of Douglas Brown in the Catawba Indians, the earliest important chief of the Catawba he, sorry, that was my first try on that one, uh, traveled to Virginia as far as Fort Christiana in 1717 to deliver the child hostages to Governor Spotswood at Fort Christiana. During, during the attack on the fort, and this was an attack by the Iroquois and the, uh, the Seneca particularly, he was captured by the Northern Indians and made his escape dramatically by running all the way home back to Nassau. And Nassau is here. It's the biggest circle on this map. That's the Catawba. That's the Catawba name for the Catawba. There, um, he then traveled to Charleston to recount his story. There he was likened to Powhatan or Opikankanu as a hero. Traditionally, he was the cacique of the Catawba who drew the famous Catawba deerskin map. He was also known in legend as Astog or Sapona. So the Catawbas believe this map was drawn by him um, and that he presented it to Governor Nicholson in 1721. And there are a few interesting things about this map. And I'll tell you, I'm not sure of the time, so I'll tell you as much as I can about it. Um, the Catawba are, this is, in my view, a, a land acknowledgement as well. 
The Catawbas are stating who they are, where they are. They're calling attention to the fact that they have pretty strong neighbors in the Chickasaw and the Cherokee up here. They are also indicating the road that's traveled here and the roads that are traveled around in other directions, the roads travel between them. So these are important to look at because there are also notations on this map. And the notations could be a little suspect because as you notice, this map has been turned so that it's moving east-west, the, the traditional preferred route of settler maps during this time period. Two contemporary copies of the Catawba Deerskin map are extant, one in the British Museum and one in the Library of Congress, but the original is lost. The map was given to Governor Francis Nicholson in 1721, who sent it back to London, but not before a clerk made two copies. Now, I mention this because you'll notice that these are written in English, for one thing, the notations on the circles, and they name the tribes that are within the sphere of the Catawba, as I say, perhaps a Catawba Confederacy, um, the Watery, the Sugary, um, and other important tribes. One tribe that's missing here are the Saponi, who are clearly in the Catawba records as connecting, uh, being part of the Catawba sphere. Now, right here, you see this blob this box that is Virginia and it's labeled Virginia. Down here, you see a carefully created some kind of space. Um, it's often been referred to as a, as a uh, city space, cityscape with a harbor. So most uh, scholars refer to the, the uh, Southern city of uh, the Southern area as the city of Charleston. Now, I will say one thing. There are many ideas about the Catawba map. Most people um, associate it with the Catawba. A lot of people call it the deerskin map so that they don't associate it with anyone. Um, and there has even been a more recent article suggesting that this is a Cherokee map meant to show the Cherokee's new trading partnership with Virginia, which is what uh, Virginia is always trying to um, have come about in the 18th century. So looking at the inscription, there's even one down here. You see this here where you see a hunter and a deer and it's labeled um, an Indian man. Uh, no, let me make sure I get this right. An Indian a uh, hunting, like a apostrophe hunted. Sounds like a song. Um, so according to the names given here, it still reads like a Catawba map, but some of the additions, like here's a whole addition uh, designate, telling us the history of it, that it was done for Governor Nicholson and given to him and dedicated to the Prince of Wales, actually. Also very suspect for me is this notation that this is the English road to Nassau. Um, Charleston was very keen on trading with the Catawba and the Catawba um, collected scouts for South Carolina. So a road between the two was very important. What makes me feel like this is even more of a Catawba map is this road, however, because there was also a road that went around the Catawba and up to, um, up to the town of um, what was then not called Wilkesboro, but it was called Mulberry, and over to Salem. And that was a way that at least in the 19th century, the Moravians traveled down to uh, their missionaries in um, Georgia. So that road is very well known too. Okay, so um, what have we got here? You know, that that's the question. And where, where did this come from? And, and what's what do we think we're seeing? Um, one of the, when I first saw this map, I was listening to a lecture by Max Edelston, uh, UVA professor of colonial history. And he had just finished, he had just finished as a Mellon Indigenous Arts Fellow where he had worked on the material for his 
book published in 2017 called The Map of Empire. And it's the British view of their empire in, in the American colonies. And Max talked about this in terms of the, um, definitely in terms of the uh, Catawba presence and the Catawba presence in South Carolina, because eventually they are given land in South Carolina. What I immediately saw in this is that I wanted to turn this north to south. I wanted to see going from Charleston up to Virginia, because then it became for me the very homeland that I come from, the, the Piedmont, North Carolina area that the Catawba once inhabited. So keep that in mind. I saw this map when UVA professor of colonial history, Max Edelston, um, first presented it in his work on the Catawba. Immediately, I knew this place as depicting the Piedmont and the Yadkin River Basin. Now I'm gonna go back and forth between these, these modern and older maps. This is the Yadkin, uh, what's, called, what's known in this time period as the Sapona River, but it's the Yadkin PD River Basin. It's one of the massive rivers resources of the Carolinas. It actually, here's the Yadkin, here's our turn at East Bend, Here's the South Yadkin, the Catawba River. All of these rivers come off, a lot of rivers, the Waccamaw come off of what's called the PD in South Carolina and the Yadkin in North Carolina. I knew of the Sora and the Saponi and the traditions of the native peoples who had been there. In the 18th century, the Catawba were a large nation whose diplomatic skills were legendary and tied them to all of Carolina and Virginia. As Edelson said in an interview, um, the Catawba map is like a subway map. Let's go back here to look at the Catawba map. If the Catawba map is like a subway map. I felt it indicated my homeland and everything I had heard as a child. But who's the runner and where should, who's the runner where we should have been in the map? So. In my looking at this, I first looked at this and I said, oh yeah, I understand this. This is, I know how to get here. I know where this is going. I know where the roads are. And it reflects to me the Yadkin River Basin and the Ohari River that comes off of that. But where are we? And where are the Sapona? Where are the Saponi? So for me, I kept looking in this area. I've lost my cursor here, sorry. I kept looking in this area right here. So where's that circle? Instead, you have this very enigmatic figure of, um, could be a woman, could not be a woman. But it's a figure that appears to be walking and directing itself towards the South. I believe the runner is a messenger from the Monacans and the Saponi people. The Saponi and Monacans are both now in Virginia in this state. The Saponi always consulted with the Catawbas. There are multiple references of Saponi messengers coming into the Catawba uh, towns and they have more conversation, what's going on in other parts of the Piedmont. The figure conveys, the, the map conveys the entire Piedmont network in a succinctly accurate window. It portrays the fact that the Saponi are not here right now. The Saponi have moved, they're moving around, but they are still the messengers that connect the Monacans and the Catawba. Even Charleston, a place the Catawba knew well, is accurately portrayed, unlike the shadowy box that represents Virginia. So they know Charleston, they're there a lot, and Virginia is just some place they get messages from. Oh, and I should reference another thing and credit, um, a credit historian Karen Warren, who did research for me in Charleston. One thing that uh, I didn't know about Charleston is it was a 17th century, I guess, 17th century, yeah, 17th century uh, fortified city originally. And now uh, they have found brick fortification walls under the city of Charleston. So, uh, Karen, studied those, looked at them, and photographed them for me. So I think the cacique, when he did this map, was very accurate in what he was doing. 
Um, I put this slide in just so you'd have the um, reference to the uh, um, indigenous map making, um, the indigenous map making site of um, Stefan, oh gosh, he's the Greek name, <laughs> Stephanitis, who um, is in working, he's a, in the research laboratories, the archaeology at the University of North Carolina, um, to whom I'm acknowledging the information on the maps. He's done the research on it. So I wanted to make sure I gave him some, gave him credit for this. Oh, I don't know what I hit there. My apologies for hitting it. <laughs> so I've done this once before. This happened to me before, so it may have to just stay there. Okay, uh, the Catawba map is not the only deerskin map. So there were many of them, evidently. This is called, known as the Chickasaw map. It was given to Governor Nich Nicholson in 1723. Um, you see different tribes here on the map. Interestingly enough, in the circles, you've got the Cherokee, uh, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw. Um, I hope I'm reading these right. Uh, I may have gotten them in the wrong order. But most importantly, you've got the English over here in a big circle labeled English. So these are the networks of the Chickasaw Nation, which is on the Great Mississippi River, of course, over here. The maps are testimony to the lands possessed, possessed by the indigenous peoples of the Southeast and the British colonial period, as well as diplomatic gestures from one powerful chief to another. So the chief of the Chickasaw is making his statement to Governor Nicholson equally, reciprocity and respect. They are living land acknowledgements from the 18th century. Finally, I'm gonna take you back as far as I wanna go today to the, uh, one of these famous expeditions to the North Carolina back country. This one, in this case, the Letterer ex Expedition of 1670, where he is very clearly mapping the people. And not only that, he's visiting with them. Um, to conclude the trip through the tunnel and our editing of the historical record, we end with one of the most fascinating settler documents of the 17th century. The account of John Letterer that he wrote of his expedition to Carolina in 1670, when Carolina was truly Indian country. He left from Tidewater, Virginia, the British toehold on the coast. He met with the Issa, that's the Mon Monican name for the Monicans, he slept with the Sora. They are down in Surrey County, North Carolina. He was led by Saponi guides and he ate a great feast of roasted deer and stewed peaches with the Nassau, the Catawba, once he reached that area. And then he went quickly back to Virginia, the, the safety of Virginia. He was greeted with both hospitality and hostility as he made his way and paved the way for more settler incursions. So Letterer, people like Letterer and Bird who surveys the line and takes 20,000 acres of North Carolina as his prize are the, um, they're the beginnings of this incursion that unsettles this beautiful balance I have uh, presented for you. I'm quoting from Linda Tewa Smith, uh, one of the, the great Maori scholar um, on decolonization and this book, Decolonizing Methodologies. She, um, it's a great book to have and it's been reprinted in 2021. Imperialism frames the indigenous experience. So it does frame it, it does encircle it. Um, we have circled all the way back to our beginnings and the words, the worlds of the Monacan Confederacy, the Powhatan Confederacy, and I would suggest the Catawba Confederacy, and back to the map that John Smith opened in 1612. I hope we've been able to restore some of the erasure of the Siouan peoples of the Piedmont. As the project continues, increasingly more indigenous stories have emerged and will emerge. The Monacans, the Saponi, the Catawba, the Lumbee, and many more of the persona of this drama are still there, are still here, and dancing to the light. My grandmothers and my grandfathers must be there too. And some good books for you. I'm a librarian, so I always think that when I teach research, you need new books and you need old books. 
Um, these are the two I used uh, extensively for this talk. And I would also recommend uh, Max Edelson's book, The Map of Empire, to get the, the new map of empire, to get the, the British view. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. That was uh, quite a very um, rich walk back. And it struck me as how when we walked back, how much more you could actually feel the way the land had been settled. So thank you for that. That's my impression, but there's other questions and comments here um, way back from the beginning of your talk. Um, <clears throat> so let me go back and ask that. Uh, and please feel free to put some things in the chat. This is, this is from Mary. Native children many times refer to ants as aunties or grandmothers. These do not seem to reflect blood relationships. Could you speak to this? I certainly can. Um, I grew up thinking this was a Southern habit because um, my family had some conversation about their background, but, um, you know, many things were kept quiet um, during the, those racial, those uh, years of racial laws. Um, so we generally call them ants and ants. Uh, my son right now has ants that are both his blood ants and ants who are people he shows respect to, ants who advise him, who consult with him, and who form a circle around him when things are not, um, when he, he needs it, when he needs support. I had the same all of my life. Um, I'm sure my grandmother in that picture has her aunt who she was close to as well. Um, and I think that's, and grandmothers, grandmothers transfer everything uh, for my family. They, they are crucial, all the grandmothers, one grandmother, is indigenous, but the others um, were not. But all the stories, they passed the stories on. I wouldn't know very much about who these people were um, or where to find their, their burials or without my grandmother. My grandmother who attended uh, black churches in the thirties and sang and who took me as a very small child to something she called an Indian revival in uh, Greensboro where her father had moved to. Her father moved because uh, he became a sharecropper um, on the land that uh, had been their land. And so he moved to Greensboro. So all of this with grandmothers and uh, aunts and aunties, it's vital to how I grew up. And I think it's vital for indigenous children. As you say, I think it proves a lot about the stories of my family. I understand who they are a lot through that. Does that answer your question? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm seeing Michael smile. And so I'm assuming <laughs> that <laughs> um, Mike had a question as well. He said, um, ask you about the impact of the Racial Integrity Act of the 1920s later, um, which led to erasure. Yes. Um, well, I hope I've demonstrated that it was not an outlier. That was just a systematic move. Um, it, to me, it goes back to the laws that required the Pamunkey and the Mattapanai to wear badges um, to prove they were Indians or they could be shot on sight. That's an, that came about um, in the 1670s in Virginia. So that trail of racial laws um, just sort of increased in the 19th century, driven by so many uh, so many of the laws that then produced Jim Crow laws. So um, I looked for some um, some specific North Carolina laws that were like the Racial Integrity Act, and so far haven't found that specific enforcement. Um, I'm sure they existed. I, you know, I, I just haven't run into that law yet. I think that was a particularly heinous law in Virginia. It was a state law, as I understand it. So I haven't found the comparable law unless you want to consider the law that forced divorces and, and prevented racial interracial marriage. Didn't prevent it. It continued uh, on in North Carolina. So I'm not real sure about that, Mike. Okay. 
Um, Bill Spiden had a few questions. Uh, this was again earlier in when you were saying that the white man made the land better. Does that mean they cut down the trees for farming and developments or does that mean something else? Um, I think within the context of what uh, was expected of them as British subjects, when they got the land, they were supposed to improve it. I think it was cutting down the trees, farming, agricultural, you know, dividing it up into plots that were the in individual yeoman farmer. You see often that there are plots allotted of 50 acres so that people can farm and improve the land and have this sort of wonderful replica of Britain, of England, um, and how the, the land is separated. Uh, the Moravians do that as well. They, they begin, they spread out, they go, they create several towns and they begin to create acreage that each family buys and makes better and they trade. So it's, yes, I think it's required of them actually because the land can be taken from them if they don't improve it. Mm. Huh. Um, Bill asks again, do you know of any treaties kept by the Europeans other than with the Cherokee Koala group now in town of Cherokee, North Carolina? Now the Koala boundary is again, sort of like the situation that happened with my family where um, my grand, one of my grandfathers divorced, had to divorce his wife and his children grew up with another wife somehow <laughs> that he had. <laughs> Um, not sure about all that, but she had the land. She was a white woman. So um, the Kuala boundary was also a purchase um, in the name of a, of a white uh, man, I believe, that created this safety zone for the Eastern Band Cherokee, which is in the um, that whole area uh, that's around and near um, Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, I do know that um, you're speaking of trees, right? I do know that my mother uh, talked a lot about heritage apple trees, um, that, but I don't know, I know the corn, uh, that there are different types of corn, different types of beans that were preserved. And my uh, grandmother very preciously guarded the beans, those little bags and cloth of beans. So uh, I think, you know, they pass those down. Um, trees, I just, I'm not smart enough on trees. I, to do that. Well, I apologize because I said the word treaties. Oh, treaties. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I found your answer fascinating. And I, so, um, but anyway, oh, to re it. Well, tell <laughs> do you know me many about treaties. Okay. Yes. Right. Treaties kept by the Europeans other than with the Cherokee Koala Group, now in the town of Cherokee, North Carolina. Gotcha. Now that makes more sense. Thank you. <laughs> My <laughs> apologies. See, I can't hear tonight. Uh <laughs> um, the, um, there are so many treaties. There are so many. And they are individually with groups. And then there are the summits that hope, where the Virginia governors hope to pull everybody together and have the Iroquois sort of uh, be the dominant feature and have everybody sign basically. And that, that's very big on getting uh, the land in Kentucky. That's the first really big battle that goes on. Oh, not the first, but uh, one of the big battles um, to grab that land from the Shawnee who are the ones. Uh, so they sort of get caught in a vise between the Cherokee and the Iroquois, all these Sioux and peoples because the Cherokee and the Iroquois are cousins. They're the Iroquois speaking tribes of the Southeast. Um, the coastal tribes in parts of North Carolina and in Virginia are, of course, Algonquin speakers. So they're, uh, they're not natural uh, allies. So, um, so I think uh, the treaties, uh, well, the treaties, certainly with the Catawba, which are the ones I know best about, that, and um, the Treaty of uh, Log, Logstown, which affects the Monica nation, those treaties aren't kept by the Europeans, just like the proclamation line is not kept. Generally, the Catawba, uh, in the Treaty of uh, Pine Hill, the Catawbas agree to vacate to South Carolina. Um, and that's why, if you've ever seen the map of North Carolina, there's a funny little jut in the shape of the map of North Carolina. That was to include the Catawba. Uh, the Catawba had about two, 
2 million acres? That doesn't sound right somehow, but given to them in that, the Treaty of Pine Hill. And it it's their original location, Pine Hill was Camden, South Carolina. So um, they were moving further into South Carolina. So um, they kept the rules on that. They moved, they, but the settlers moved right into the Catawba lands in South Carolina. So it was always, you know, everyone made their best effort and then you can't stop, you just couldn't stop the surge. It's just mm -hmm. a surge and people pay no attention mm -hmm. to things like the proclamation line. And all of it gets worse after the um, American revolt. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we have five minutes and there's uh, one question, well, two more questions, don't wanna forget the survey, but do native people prefer to be called indigenous people, first people, native people or Indians or what? Whoa, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm the person to answer that. Um, I'm a member of the American Indian Library Association, have been since about 2002. And um, so I take my cue from, from that group. So I will tend to use uh, American Indian. Um, Native American seems a little bit formal to me. Um, and I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. Honestly, First Nations tends to be Canada. Um, mm. Mike, Mary, you can help me out on this one. <laughs> you can yeah, tell both of you can. That. So um, most definitely. Um, I think if, if one wants to be really on target, then they would you know, identify what nation they were from. Exactly. Yeah. You know, that they were Lakota or they were, you know, uh, Blackfeet or Cherokee, or what have, you know. Yeah. I so. think that that's absolutely, Mike and Mary also wrote that. That's absolutely the correct answer. That's why we've got many projects trying to undo the bad uh, um, descriptive metadata we've done in libraries where we don't refer to tribal nations. The Saponi are a tribal nation, the Catawba are a tribal nation, the Monacans. So. I think for folks who grew up like me, a white woman who got this one homogeneous group, um, that that question, you know, is one that is asked from a place of wanting to do the right thing, you know, but not knowing what that is. So this is really helpful to understand what you're saying and the way you talked about each nation or each tribe, if you will, um, I think it helps to give us a sense, a better understanding of what it is Mike was just saying, what you were just saying about, you know, how to how to respectfully refer to the people. Uh, let's see, when you were introduced, a Dutch connection was mentioned. Can you explain? Uh, Dutch? Connect Dutch connection was mentioned. When you were introduced, a Dutch connection was mentioned. Um, I don't think so. I actually don't have any uh, background that would be Dutch. I do, oddly enough, descend in my settler side from a man called Dutchman John Brown, but he turns out not to be either Dutch or German. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he just called himself what he wanted to. Um, so I, you know, I don't know what that would have come about. Okay. All right. Uh, Mary says, thank you for going back to uh, really tell the story of early erasure, first contact forward, that laid the groundwork for many laws and policies to erase the native populations through the generations to even today. Um, and she refers to, please call us by our tribal names as we're not one homogeneous group. Um, Brianna says, interchangeable, best use is their Indian nation. Yeah. Um, and then are the Mattapanai a tribal nation? Linda asked that question. Uh, yes, they, there are state recognized and federally recognized nations. Um, and the Mattapanai are a uh, state recognized nation and the upper Mattapanai are a federally recognized nation. Okay. And that's purely, you know, on the side of the settler in that because uh, they are nations and they know they are nations. Mm. 
I'm going to launch the poll if, if people could take the time to fill out those survey questions. We would appreciate it. And we are at 6.59. That, that's <laughs> right on the nose there. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming. Uh, there's some thank yous in the chat. Um, I'm going to let, I'm going to un turn off the recording.